Hello, how's it going? In this video, I'm going to get a triangle. I'm going to fill in the triangle. But before I get to that, I'm going to talk about the math involved. Barycentric coordinates. So I'm not entirely sure where barycentric comes from, but we can think of barycentric coordinates as vertex centric coordinates. Let's say we have three vertices. Each of these coordinates, each of these bits, these components, corresponds with one of the corners. So let's say we have one, zero, zero, that's exactly on one of the three corners. Zero, one, zero would be exactly on one of the other three corners, and so on. And any point in general can think of as a weighted average of the three corners. This tells us a few things. Let's say we have, whoops, U, V, and W are the three components of a barycentric coordinate. One thing that we know is all of them will be in the range from zero to one. So they'll be positive and they'll be less than one individually. And then furthermore, because they are weightings, for a weighted average, their sum is one. So that's pretty interesting. Um, but I'm just going to talk about the general idea with this triangle. So let's say we have a triangle and we throw it at a compute shader and we say, okay, these are the three corners of the triangle, fill in the interior. And I found this method online and I'll link it in the video description. I think the author does a really good job of explaining how this works. But the idea is we basically, using the three corners, build a bounding box around the triangle. And then that is a rectangular region in 2D space, you know, once everything's projected to the screen. And each of the pixels in that region will either be inside the triangle or outside the triangle. So let's say we get that bounding box, we look over every single pixel in that bounding box, and we test it to see if it's inside the triangle. And if it is, then we draw it and so on. So the fact is we've got these three positions, let's call them A, B, and C. Using those three positions, we can construct three vectors, the vector position at A, the vector direction from A to B, and the vector direction from A to C. And these three vectors form a basis for the triangle. Side note, math is good, um, especially in linear algebra. So when we talk about having a basis and having basis vectors, one of the big results of that is that every element of the set can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors. And that's what I'm doing here. So we'll say, okay, Let's say the position P is one times the basis vector A plus some unknown coefficient times the direction, you know what I'm saying, from A to B, plus some other unknown coefficient times the direction from A to C. Now, traditionally, I um, can look in here. This is going to be a little diffuse, this explanation, but I can rearrange the sum here to give me the expression w is 1 minus u minus v and then i can express this differently so i can say um, the position p would be the w component so 1 minus u minus v times a plus u times b plus v times c and then if we were to take this vector expression and rearrange it we get the same expression that we have here. These things are the same. So the goal is we want to find the unknowns u and v. We can rearrange things to get, you know, a system equals zero. And then because these are vectors, we can decompose them into their components. So you have, you know, the x component of that a minus p. By the way, Oh no, 
I'll talk about that in a second, um, the x component times u and all this, we can see this. So we get these two equations, these, this first equation equals zero, the second equation equals zero, and then if we look at just the x component, this is, you know, one times this quantity plus u times this quantity plus v times this quantity. And we can express it in terms of two vectors, one uv being the first vec3, and then those quantities being the second vec3. And because we're multiplying component-wise and summing everything together, that's an expression of a dot product. So the thing which I think is really cool about this is we get like dot products and cross products out of this, even though the original problem sort of has nothing to do with it. This is what I'm saying, math is cool. Anyway, so this dot product comes out to zero, and then I just saved myself a bit of writing, but we have the second dot product coming out to zero as well. And if you know anything about dot products, when the dot product of two non-zero vectors comes out to zero, that indicates that the two vectors are orthogonal to each other. So we've got, you know, these two vectors, we've got a third vector which is orthogonal to both of them. The way we would produce that is take the two vectors, take their cross product, and that produces a third vector which is orthogonal to the other two. So yeah, like we've got here, this unknown vector, 1uv, is orthogonal to these two other vectors. So it's the normal of those two vectors. If, if you were to imagine those two vectors as being coplanar, they form a plane and the normal of that plane is the storing the barycentric coordinate. So all we need to do is take the cross product of these two vectors and that will give us the barycentric coordinate. So if we were to look at this as an algorithm, we have the three corners, A, B, and C, plus the point which we want to test, whether it's interior or exterior. First of all, we compute the barycentric coordinate by that cross product. Then there's a bit of a funky thing because as you would know, with cross products, the order that we perform the cross product changes the sign of the vector. So, the x component of the barycentric coordinate is meant to be one, but it might be negative one. And this part is not super well explained by the author, but I'm getting the impression that it's come from some amount of frustration and it's just a catch-all condition. But um, the basic idea is one way to check whether a point is inside the triangle or not is to check if the, the one component is less than one in its magnitude. And if that's the case, we can return this sort of dummy vector. This X component here indicates that it's outside of the triangle. Okay. On the other hand, if we go back, we look at this. We've got this one minus U minus V for the X component, the W component, sorry. And that's sort of what's happening here. We have one minus u minus v, but then normalized by the normalizing factor. This is sort of a homogeneous, it's similar to homogeneous coordinates. If we divide everything out by that bcx, then the first component of this vector would be sort of close enough to one. And then we have u normalized, v normalized, and that's our barycentric coordinates. And then the idea basically is if any of these are negative, then the barycentric coordinate is outside of the triangle. And then the really cool thing about barycentric coordinates is that we can directly use them to interpolate any attribute. So it doesn't matter whether this is a color or a texture coordinate or anything. Let me just do color for instance. So the color will be one minus u minus v times the color at vertex A plus u times the color at vertex B plus v times the color at vertex C. And we can do this for any attribute because like I'm saying, barycentric coordinates are a weighted average of the influence 
of the three corners. Okay, so I hope this wasn't too much, but I just wanted to... I like math. Anyway, let's get in and have a look at the coding. Okay, so most of the, or well, all of the stuff I'll be doing today will be in the uh, compute shader. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just add in a new function, which will give me the Barry centric coordinates of a point. So I'll just call this get Barry centric coordinates. And like I was saying on the paper, I'm going to take the three corners of the triangle and the corner which is in question, the corner which is being tested. So the first thing I'll do is get the barycentric coordinate of that point, which, side note, every point has barycentric coordinates. It's just only a subset of those barycentric coordinates which correspond to actual points within the triangle. So this is the real barycentric coordinate, if that makes sense. How many times can I say that? So um, I'll get my x vector, which will be um, a minus p, and then b minus a, and then c, and then the same, but just the y components. Okay, then I'll go ahead and test the x component of the barycentric coordinate. If I've got that, then that's an early failure case, and I'll just return a dummy vector. But provided we get here, then we probably got something meaningful. So I'll go ahead and return that uh, expression that I gave on the paper. Okay, so then the next part is uh, using this. And I'm actually going to get rid of this, this draw line function. I'm not going to use it. Um, I'll take bits of it and put it back in the original function. So just the same as before, we'll get the index and the screen size will be useful. And we'll have this early exit and the triangle index. Yep, that's perfectly fine. Then we've got the three vertices. Now I'm going to get the screen positions and colors. I'll get that for the third component as well. Okay, great. So now I'll go ahead and find the bounding box for the triangle. So we're going to have, oh, I'll do this in integers. So we'll have um, the bounding box min and max for the minimum I'll be getting yeah basically the minimum of all of the positions component wise and again the same for the maximum okay so now I'll be looking through that region and so I'll have a variable x I'm going to start this you know, I could start this at the minimum. Just like that. But what I'm also going to do is I'm also going to clip this against the screen. So like, let's say we have a triangle, which is off to the left. Well, then B box min will be a negative number. But I don't want that. So I just want um, whichever comes first the side of the screen or the size of the box. And then similarly, whichever comes first, the right side of the screen or the right side of the box. And then I'll go ahead and do the same thing for the Y. So we'll have a nested loop in here. So now I'll go ahead and do the barycentric coordinate test. So I'll get the barycentric coordinates of that point. Mm -hmm. 
and then I'll test. So if any of these components are negative, then it's not inside the triangle. But otherwise we are valid. So we'll get the color for this fragment just by the barycentric coordinates. And then we'll go ahead and write that in. Okay, and that's it. Very elegant, very straightforward. Um, let's go ahead and compile that. So I accidentally hit the run button. It's compiling it right now. And then I quickly went in and started compiling the shader and it was giving me errors. And I quickly fixed the errors before it finished compiling. So we'll see if this works. Okay, there we have it. So we've got our triangle and it's filled in. And very clearly this is really hurting performance, but that's totally fine because this is absolutely almost the worst case scenario for this shader. I mean, we've got one triangle, sorry, we're not, yeah, we've got one triangle. We've got one thread filling in the whole triangle on the GPU. This method will benefit in two cases. Number one, when we have a lot of triangles, so we can have a lot of threads doing one thread per triangle. And then number two, when the triangles are small on the screen, so each individual thread is not doing that much work. The flip side to this is we've got the triangle issue down to a two-dimensional region of pixels, the bounding box. So if we have a two-dimensional region, we can make a two-dimensional compute shader job, one thread per fragment. Unreal Engine found that with particularly small triangles, compute shaders were way faster. But then with larger triangles, they went with a traditional rendering method. And I'm going to do something like that. I'm going to, in the next video, I'm going to make a compute shader, which does a triangle on a per fragment basis. Um, but yeah, that'll be it for now. And I hope to see you in the next video. Bye. Hey, so I was about to edit this video, but then I remembered I've got new Patreon supporters. So really big thank you to all of my channel supporters. Um, if you would like to support me, it's just $2.50 a month. But um, if you'd like to give more, I won't say no. So without further ado, a really big thank you to Antonin Carette, Dank Your Falls, Declan, Andalon Studios, Catania, Gary Duchenne, Jean Falsvilla, Lane Duhit, Mathieu de Rick, and Moim. Thank you so much, my dudes. Making high quality videos takes time and I guess it takes even less time when I go on random tangents and deep dives, but thank you so much. It really does mean a lot. I know I just complained about a Mandarin Americano, but having that little extra bit to uh, buy coffee, it really does make a difference. I'm looking so tired at the moment. Ah, okay. But thank you really, truly. Um, it means a lot. Um, I hope things are going well and yeah, have a good one. Bye.